my name is Kosti Hokkanen. Um, nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit around why you need a semantic layer and why it's obviously a good idea. Uh, just a little brief, like if you are not aware, a semantic layer is basically a layer that sits on top of your data warehouse and which contains all of the logic needed to get some metrics out of your tables. So basically how you aggregate data, which table you query, uh, what kind of filters you should apply, etc. Uh, before I dive a little uh, deeper into that, a uh, couple of words around who am I, why am I here. So I'm, I'm currently a senior data engineer at Supermetrics, uh, working in our data platform team, responsible for most of the tooling we use with data, which includes, uh, for example, DPT. Um, I've been working with data in B2B SaaS business since 2017. Uh, in a couple of companies, I built data warehouse with uh, good old stored procedures. I built it with DPT. I wouldn't go back to stored procedures. Um, yeah, I started as an analyst, and then I've been now drifting to the more engineering heavy roles during my time, and which is why I'm now working on the data platform side. Um, at Supermetrics, one of the first things I jumped in was when we started implementing DPT and Looker, uh, Looker first and DPT a couple of months after that. And been there driving that development for a while, now, step, now have stepped maybe a little bit aside from that world. And I'm a big believer in tools that make it easy to do things in the right way, uh, which is why I like also DPT, because it makes it easy to, for example, write tests on your data, write documentation for your data, have your uh, code version controlled, etc. Um, but yeah, to the actual uh, topic, uh, I'm gonna walk you through an example from the software engineering world. You might ask why, but you will figure it out later. But let's have an example of like, uh, let's say we are now building a company, we have this imaginary application and now we are going to jump into the code base of it and which might give you some nightmares going, going, up, going forward. But let's say that like initially uh, we have an application, it has some users and there are multiple places in the software where we need to somehow need the number of users. So there has been Kosti, the software engineer, jumping there on the first coding project and has written this kind of like queries all around the software. Well, yeah, it works. It gives you the number. It does what you need to do it. In this case, print it out, but it could be whatever. Let's say that this application starts to grow. Um, there's now like 20 different places in the application where we have this similar kind of code which gives you the number of users for a certain, uh, certain country. Then there comes a moment when someone realizes that, hey, we need to change our database structure a bit. So we have had, uh, before we had this nice users table, which has the country as a string like Finland, Sweden in it. And then someone says that we actually need to now normalize this country out of this table because we want to report companies that also have countries and we want to use the same list of countries. So what happens is that after that there will be a users table and instead of the country name as a string we will have a country ID there and then we'll have another table countries which has the country ID and the, name, and the country name as a string. Well if we look back on the previous slide we know this that hey now we are actually in not a very good place because we have now 20 places in our application where we need to go and change each of these to uh, run a different query. Uh, if, if we are good in knowing our application we have like good understanding of these we know where these are but it is still we might break something when we make this change and there might be some odd, odd cases there. But what if we have in the beginning designed this whole thing a little bit differently? 
So what if we have had there one layer of abstraction? So if we look at this code, uh, we don't have to look it too closely, but now we, uh, we can separate that everything above this is sort of uh, centralized code that is, that is designed to get you users for a central country. You might notice that it looks a lot like a metric uh, to query for, but then the actual the other software developers that are using now this in 20 different places across the application database, they only need to do this. So they only need to get users by country and this adds the string that they want to get it for. Uh, so it's all already, uh, first of all, a lot simpler for the other software developers to use because they don't need to care, care about the implementation details uh, of the database connection when they want to just use that metric. So basically, um, yeah. So if we would have done it this way, what is the change we need to do there? We change just the query in this place. Of course, like there's better ways to do this. It's still not like perfect, but yeah, you, uh, you get the point that now we have a single place where we change the definition on how we get this number of uh, number of users for a certain country. And then actually they, these, all of the users, all of the other developers across our company that need to use this information, they don't need to change anything just because some implementation detail in a database changed. But someone who uh, implements this API to, the, to that data uh, can do that for them. And this brings us to the key change that we actually did there. There is now a layer of abstraction in, bet uh, in between the database and the, and the actual users there in the code base. And basically anyone who needs to have a data, uh, data for that metric, they don't need to care about the implementation details. They don't necessarily need to even care in which database that uh, data lives. But they, they only ask for that metric and they get it. And this brings us also that we maintain that metric in a single place. And this probably makes a lot of sense when we put it like this. So the key question is, why are we still building data warehouses like this? That we have a warehouse, essentially a database. And then we have business users from some Google Sheet running some random query. They need to know the which data warehouse to connect to. They need to know which kind of query to run, which table to query. We then have some dashboard, for example, in Looker Studio, which has then kind of a similar, it might return the similar numbers now. It might, not, it might or might uh, still return the same number a year from here. A little bit different table, containing same data maybe from a different phase of the transformations. And this could go on and on and on. We have a, um, and then uh, these, all of these reporting tools and data users, they need to know quite a lot of the implementation details there. But what the semantic layer actually, where is the value? We can do the same thing, but we have a warehouse. We put put there a semantic layer, which now knows that, hey, in order to get this metric, I need to go to this warehouse. I need to send this kind of a query. If it changes, we can change it in the semantic layer. But now the one who actually needs the data, what they actually care about is they want this metric, number of users. So they can select it from wherever they use. They can query it from Looker Studio, from Google Sheet, from a notebook, but this is the like core principle of the semantic layer that it has a like single place where you define this and then everyone can just query for that because probably they don't want to write a query in their notebook. They want to just get the number. So semantic layer, is it actually just an API? Well, we could say so. And if we think about semantic layer as an API, we can take a lot of learnings uh, that the software engineering industry has had in the past years because the history of APIs is maybe a little bit longer. And what it, when it helps us the most is when certain changes happen. And you might think, what kind of changes? 
Well, let's go through a few examples. This is the one, maybe a common thing. We have all been there. We have a, you have a DPT model that you built one day. You realize that, oh, I named it quite poorly. It's not actually according to the newest standards that we have. Uh, it's not very intuitive. I want to change that. But when you have 200 users curing that table daily to get some sort of data, it's sort of like it requires a bit more to uh, justify that. Like, hey, I, I want to add this F, uh, FCT to, uh, prefix for this table. Um, it helps to sort of, uh, it helps in those kind of cases. Because then you can just in the semantic layer change the table name where you query it from. And the end users actually, they don't even need to know about it. It's the table will change, they, the results will stay the same, but it's not affecting them. Uh, this actually is kind of the same thing. It might be just that you rename the table, but sometimes it happens that you want to change to a completely different table. Uh, it might be that you need uh, to add some dimensions for this metric, which requires some extra transformation. You need to create a mart maybe on top of your fact table. Um, anything can happen and then you will, for the same metric, uh, you will just change it to curate a different physical table in the data warehouse. It's still like, uh, you now with semantic layer, you can do this under the hood and the end user again, they don't need to know. It's a little implementation detail. Um, change of metric definition, this is something we already touched a little bit upon, but it's, uh, uh, it might be that usually what happens, especially with younger businesses, is that over time you learn more about your business. It, with the number of users, it might happen that you realize one day that, hey, actually we are counting, or we are uh, having internal users in this metric, we might want to exclude these. Or it might be that like, hey, you have counted this total revenue and you realize you need to exclude refunds from this or refunded orders. And then you need to change the metric definition. If you don't have a semantic layer, you, you will need to go to each of the places where this is being curated and ensure that those curates are changed. Until you realize next month that, hey, actually we need to make another change and you start from the scratch. With the semantic layer, you will do it there and it will go for everyone. And one thing uh, that actually probably DPT semantic layer won't help you with this, but some others might, is that you might even decide that you want to switch the data warehouse completely. You have had your Redshift running for many years. You now want to jump on the Snowflake or something else. Uh, if you have a good semantic layer there on top of your data, you can even do these kind of changes without the end users even noticing. Uh, just because there's the layer of abstraction. So, a little summer, summary of what we have just men, went through. The first point in justifying is preparing for the inevitable change. Uh, you probably, you won't know beforehand what it is that changes, when it changes, how remarkable that change is. But if you have good tooling, those allow you to make those changes with as little effort as possible. And semantic layer is one thing, one of those things. It will help you, it will help you in those cases when inevitably something changes. Single definition for metric calculation. Uh, well, it's not too uncommon that uh, you bring eight different board members into the same room where they present their eight different numbers for the same metric. Just, and it might be that they are using the different version of a correct theory from the different times of the history. If you have a semantic layer that is defined in one place and that is the source of truth. If someone does not agree with that truth, uh, it can be uh, think true and changed. All of those changes are recorded in a version controlled way. You can always go back to the previous version but it's the same definition for everyone. One, one thing is related to also developer experience in your data teams. Uh, having a semantic layer frees your analysts and analytics engineers, BI developers, what you want to call them, uh, to refactor things that cause pain for them. 
and it's, it might be poorly named tables, it might be poorly designed queries that get you a certain metric. Uh, when you have this abstraction, it's sort of you can do whatever under the hood and, until, and as long as you still get the same metric. And if the metric definition doesn't change, you have to of course return the same results. Uh, but this sort of frees to refactor things that cause pain there. And the last point, um, the classical, those who do not learn the history are doomed to repeat it. Um, software engineering industry as an industry is a lot more major than the data industry. And so once if we see that, hey, this semantic layer actually has a lot of connections to what APIs are, we can go to the history, look like what we have learned during the past decades on APIs. And then we can actually take some learnings from that journey and not make the same mistakes again with, uh, with our data.